The Broncos have made two signings in the last 18 hours or so, so we're going to catch you guys up to speed on both of the free agency signings. Now, full transparency, they made this second signing after we finished filming our video today. So what I did was I'm filming this part right now. I'm going to sandwich it with the other signing they had. And then the second half of the original video I had for today, I didn't want to make it a super duper long video. So what I did was I cut that part out and I'm going to put it out later today. I know it's a bit complicated, but I think it's best for the viewer. So let's start, let's start talking about Matt Pierce. So he was signed by the Broncos on a one-year contract after playing with the Giants for four seasons a 2023rd round pick out of UConn. In his career, 43 appearances, seven starts. He has been a backup tackle pretty much since day one of his NFL career. I asked our Giants host, Marshall Green, hey, the Broncos just signed Matt Peart. What are your thoughts? His words, he sucks. So we have that to look forward to. Um, now, I don't expect him to come in here and be a starter by any means. I think this is your Cam Fleming replacement as your swing tackle with Alex Palczewski, the UDFA out of Illinois who didn't play at all last season, being the only other tackle on this roster at the moment, along with Jacobs. Maybe Denver uses this to try and have a backup plan in place in case they trade Garrett Bowles since they're starting to trade or move on from some of their core pieces. I don't think this signing is an, ex, uh, an absolute signal, single that, uh, sing, signal excuse me, that they are going to be moving on from Bowles. I sure hope not because this guy isn't good and Bowles is. In his career, you can see that he's got snaps at left tackle and right tackle, no guard, no center play. So he's not a very versatile offensive lineman outside of the tackle position where he obviously has played more right than left tackle, but he does offer you a little bit of flexibility in that way. His career pro football focus grades, they've just gotten worse by the season. I mean, 69, very nice his first year. And now he finished at 42.9. And pro football focus is not the only way to measure a player, but this is a decent uh, starting point to how he plays and from what it looks like. It's not very well. So I'm not super pumped up about this signing, to be frankly honest with you guys. I hope Garrett Bowles and Mike McGlinchey never miss a snap and they play the entire season. But for now, I think you have your Cam Fleming swing tackle replacement. But let's talk about the signing that went down on Tuesday evening with Justin Stranad returning after originally planning on signing with the Carolina Panthers Following Josie Jewell, reuniting with his old DC, Ejero Evero, he decides, you know what, I want to stay in Denver after all. Now, Trinidad has been a special teamer. If you don't really recognize the name, I'm not going to fault you for that. He actually has not played a snap on defense since 2021. Now, he was a fifth-round pick in 2020, didn't play at all that rookie year, unfortunately, due to an injury, if I remember correctly. But the last two years, he has just been a special teamer through and through. So, Stranad is back, and I think for the special team side of things, it's a nice re-addition because the Broncos special teams unit last year improved from where they were the previous few seasons. And keeping a guy that plays a boatload of snaps on special teams is definitely a nice re-signing. So we can look at the updated Broncos linebacker depth chart here, and you see Stranad will sit in right behind Alex Singleton and Cody Barton. Now it remains to be seen whether or not Drew Sanders is going to play inside or outside linebacker. Like if something were to happen to Singleton or Barton, who would be that first guy off the bench? Would it be Sanders or would it be Stranad, who's been more of an inside linebacker, although he hasn't stepped on the defensive side of the field in three years at this point. So one trend that I am noticing, though, is when you have one thing happen in the universe, it's a one-off. When you've got two, you're starting to build towards a pattern. And a pattern we're seeing is a lot of players, or at least two at this, at this rate, have opted to forego an opportunity to sign elsewhere, maybe even for more money or for longer years on their deal, and stay with Sean Payton in Denver, which I know that this offseason, my tone and just my overall outlook on this team has been a little bit on the gloomier side, but there is something to hopefully players see that Sean Payton is building something in Denver, and if they can just hit on some of these draft picks and start getting that winning culture back, May not be 2024 where this team goes into the playoffs and wins a bunch of games, 
but they could be a team to watch for in 2025 if they plug a lot of holes this year and they just go into 2025 thinking, well, we are right back to where we were a few, a few years ago, a quarterback away, and Sean Payton is a good man to pick a quarterback. So to recap some of the free agent signings Denver has made thus far, P.J. Locke is back, Brandon Jones, Will Lutz, Michael Burton. So a lot of re-signings, but the biggest one being the safety from Miami. Malcolm Roach on the defensive line, little Jordan Humphrey, Adam Trotman, uh, and Cody Barton signing as well. And then we had last night Justin Stranad on what I would assume to be a one-year vet minimum deal. So will the Broncos be better than they were last season? I think the simplest way is to evaluate that by wins. Um, and probably the only way, so do you think they'll have more than eight wins? Or maybe it's a seven-win team that shows a lot more fight than this team did at the beginning and the end of 2023. I ultimately believe it comes down to the quarterback position. If we really want to just look at 2024 by itself, can Jared Stidham give you better play than Russell Wilson did? Can you find a hidden diamond in the rough in the draft, right? Whether that's a quarterback in round three like Michael Pratt or Spencer Rattler that just kind of comes out of nowhere, right? We get those every so often. Russell Wilson, Kirk Cousins, uh, Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant. So can Denver find one of those hidden gems in the draft and just completely flip this franchise upside down with not having a great quarterback plan in place, but ultimately hitting on a late day two or day three draft pick? If you're curious who else is still out there, here are the top 25 free agents available. I don't think you're going to see Denver really swing for any of these guys. I would be surprised if they did. Uh, as fun it would be for Justin Simmons to return, once you sign Brandon Jones, you pretty much close that door. And there's just not a lot of guys at positions of need for Denver, like maybe wide receiver since you traded Jerry Judy and would you want to bring back, or not bring back, would you want to reunite Michael Thomas with Sean Payton? That could be something Payton explores, but for me, I'm looking at really one position in particular that Denver has not really addressed in free agency, which is, drum roll please, the cornerback position. I think a cheap veteran cornerback is likely going to be coming in at some point before week one. The Broncos may wait to the draft, see if they get the quarterback cornerback of their you know liking, and if they don't, they go with plan B, which is, hey, we have from May till early September to sign a guy. We can bring in a Fabian Moreau like we did last season, look for the vet minimum deal, wait for players to kind of lower their asking price as the season gets closer, and we'll roll with some guy in August to compete with Riley Moss and maybe another rookie. 